My name is Alex Lauder and this is Real Opinions. Uh, my name is Alex Lauder, I'm an actor, writer and director and I'm currently in Paris in France. So I'm going to ask you some history questions to start with. Um, so how long have you been active in the industry? I've been working as an actor for about 10 years, um, but I started in theatre. So probably like in film and telly as an actor, eight years, because I think it was a couple of years before I got my first like film job. And then as like a writer and director, that's much more recent, I guess, a, a couple of years um, since I made my first short. And how did you end up doing what you do acting wise? I started as an actor because I'd already been doing like lots of like drama clubs at school when I was a teenager and loved that world, um, National Youth Theatre, etc. And then when I was about 17, there was a um, audition for a like a real piece, like a professional piece of theatre um, at a like a regional theatre near where I grew up. And that play then, I got that job and then that job then took me up to London with the same play. And then that was the start really of me working as an actor. Um, yeah, it was through that play. What was the play? The play was uh, South Downs by David Hare. And it was a, it was a funny one because it was like a one hour play. And there was two plays in the same evening. It was like the opener to another much more famous play called The Browning Version by Terence Rattigan. And David had been commissioned to write this play about his time at school in the 1960s as, yeah, schoolboy. And I played sort of a young version of David <laughs> in, um, yeah, in, in this sort of really beautiful short story, really, about, um, about a young boy learning how to uh, exist in the world. Um, despite his difference. What, where, where did it go to? Where did it transfer to, venue-wise? It transferred to the Harold Pinter Theatre, which I think had just, but it used to be called the Comedy Theatre or something, and it had just been renamed the Harold Pinter. And it was funny because I didn't, I'd never worked before and didn't know like what being an actor was. And I remember the actors at the time telling me like it was really rare that, it, you know, sort of a small play without any big, big stars in it would get a transfer up to London um, and that it would be such a happy time in terms of like everyone in the company being lovely, we're all getting along, um, it, you know, people it being well received, it moving up into town. Um, it was just sort of like the most beautiful first <laughs> experience. And I was sort of so naive to that and I just thought that that's just what happened. Um, it was a really nice way to begin. And how... Um... How do you split your time between theatre and film? Is it, do you find that now you kind of have an affinity with more than one and the other, both as a, I suppose, as an actor, but also director? It's an interesting question in terms of theatre or film and telly. I don't, as an actor, it's slightly out of my control because you come to projects as an actor once they've already been, um, once they're ready to go, basically. Apart from, I mean, more and more, I suppose, as an actor, I get involved earlier and earlier um which is lovely in 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 film stuff and telly stuff um but often it's just whatever sort of comes my way um so ideally I'd love to be doing both and to spend to be going back and forth do a bit of theatre and then a bit of film work and chop and change but actually for the last sort of year I've been doing quite a lot of theatre um which has been great and Weirdly, during that time, I've had time to write and um, think about um, creating my own stuff. So theatre, doing that as an actor, has actually given me a lot of time, has given me more time as a writer-director to think about film stuff. I imagine that, like, had I been locked into an intense six-month shoot or something as an actor, I probably wouldn't have found the time to write because I find that um, all consuming in a way, but doing a run of a play, you have your daytimes free and um, either for writing or for editing, like there's a lot of, there's, 
there's a lot of balance that you can you can find but yeah in terms of an affinity more for one I suppose I spent I spent more time making theatre because I started doing that so I'm yeah really learning the language of film all the time particularly on the other side of things as a writer and director um yeah it's sort of newer to me in a way Hmm. and do you find that you're you're writing more film and telly than you are writing theatre yeah I've never tried I think when I was like 16 I wrote a play maybe even young maybe like 14 I wrote this play because my sister was like my sister was doing at school there was like a play, like a competition um to put on plays and my older sister asked me got me writing a play for her based on this song um by Sarah Barry, I'm going to say her name wrong. A song that the uh, uh, singer songwriter had written. Um, as a 14 year old, I wrote this sort of like um, very feminist um, fairy tale uh, comedy um, for my sis. And then my sister didn't use it in the end, and I was furious. I'd written this play. And so I got my friends and I to put it on ourselves. But anyway, having since that time almost five years 15 years ago um I haven't written anything for stage I don't really know why I feel like in terms of a as a as a writer there's it seems more in my control um to write for screen because um I don't know I sort of feel like I would probably want to direct the thing that I wrote. Um, and I feel like I have a, it's, it, it's a, it's a clearer for me how to start from scratch in the film world than it is from, for me in theatre, but I, I'm, I might be wrong. It's just a feeling. I mean, I, the, the feminist fairy tale sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. It was called rejected fairy tales. <laughs> and it was about these, um, it was about like Rapunzel, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty. Uh, was there another one? I think there was a fourth. Anyway, they sort of all like ganged together and killed their partners. <laughs> they killed their respective male partners um, and poisoned them and just said like, this is enough. And Rapunzel cut her hair and Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, <laughs> it was mad. It sounds very kind of Carol Churchill. Yeah, it may be. I mean, that's quite a compliment to give a 14-year-old schoolboy, but um, uh, it was quite violent as well. I uh, I loved it. And um, I got to spend, I guess it was like an Easter holiday or something. My friends, all these girls came round to my house and we just rehearsed this um, play in my parents' garden. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, if it's violent, maybe it's like Carol Churchill meets Sarah Kane. Yeah, yeah, maybe meets um, what's it called? Um, that uh, em Emerald Fennel film. Um, oh, uh, a young woman. Yeah, there's sort of a weird vibe of that. Not also to compare myself with that amazing filmmaker, but um, definitely a similar vein. So, what's the best piece of advice that you've been given? I remember. Um, Juliet Stevenson, another, like an incredible actor. Um, I got the opportunity to play her son in a film called Departure about 10 years ago. And um, Juliet was, kept on saying to me, just trust your instinct. And I think she wrote, gave me a little present when we finished filming together with a card. And she wrote that again, sort of just protect your instincts. And I didn't really know what that meant because at that time, as an actor, you're only going on your instincts um, and maybe that's what's fun for an older actor to work with a younger actor is you just see someone who's just pure instinct and as you get older you know technique and everything and people's opinions gets in the way sometimes of just your immediate instinct um, and I think it's something that I'm always reminded of that and as a director as well actually that just you can only really trust your instinct at the end of the day and the times when I haven't, and I've sort of been disappointed with the result as, because it doesn't come from you, it comes from something external, I guess, if you're, if you're not led by your instinct, but it's hard to listen to, it's hard to hear sometimes. Uh, on the flip side, what's the worst piece of advice you've been told? 
I don't know, but I do sometimes hear like um, that some young actors are told like, oh, you'll never do this or you'll, you'll always be working for the Royal Shakespeare Company or you'll always be, you know, doing soaps or something. And that's just, I, f- I, I find myself really angry when I hear younger actors being told, oh, I've been told I will only do this because nobody knows. And if li- like, if like my acting life has taught me anything, it's like, it's always surprising what you end up doing and it's often not in your control um other than what you say yes or no to doing um and um a teacher or uh, a more experienced person I suppose we all tend to like give people advice based on what we've experienced ourselves and basically just tell people what we wish we could have heard at that age and actually often it's not very useful <laughs> Is there a place or a location that you've always wanted to make a film? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I was watching Céline Siama's film Petite Maman the other day for the first time. And I think she recreates her grandma, uh, is her grandma? Her grandma's house in that film. Um, I thought that's so, such a beautiful thing to have done. And you asking me that question right now, I'm just thinking about my grandparents houses um and just how like full of smell they are and full of like atmosphere my grandma has since moved out of the house that I knew her living in when she grew up um but it's really evocative to me and my other grandma who lives in Northern Ireland she she died last year but she um lived in a bungalow not far from the sea and actually I'm writing a short film at the moment which is about an old lady living alone near the sea. So maybe I'm trying to... (laughs) Surreptitiously it's seeping in. Yeah, yeah, those places, yeah. I will say I love, I love kind of, I think everyone has that response to like an elder member of their family where because they are older and they've lived a life, and especially if you're really, really young, that you can see so much life in it like mm. all the trinkets and all the kind of like all the trinkets yeah yeah and like it's not like my parent my grandparents that my um my granddad's both died when I was very very young um so all I can see are pictures of myself with them but as a babe as a babe in arms but I can remember bits from their house like kind of porcelain trinkets and the pattern of the carpet and stuff like that and I think it's such a you're right it's evocative because it's almost like a time capsule not in a negative way but like of a life lived rather than a a blank space it's like a it's like a amazing pre-made meal or something it sort of has so many immediate ingredients I'm now thinking of um like Xavier Dolan's tv show that he's made recently but also in a lot of his films they seem to be set in like the 90s or they sort of have something quite nostalgic about them but there's often houses full of like you know doilies on the table and um the textures being really really rich and I wonder he must have grown up around people because I can't imagine that he had his house looks like that being like a cool 30 year old um French Canadian but I imagine that that must have had, must have filtered in from, yeah, some grandparent or auntie or something. Um, the richness of that, yeah, it's so interesting. <laughs> so, um, who or what is your inspiration and has it changed over the years? Um, as an actor or as a... Either or, you can give two different answers if you want to for different roles. Yeah, maybe they're the similar thing actually, because I, I love actors and I as an actor I'm inspired by other actors like the I love Andrew Scott um I love uh Sally Hawkins um uh, I've said that in previous interviews I just go around telling people how much (laughs) I love those two um and I found that as uh they've been sort of like quite solid columns of I always just love watching their work for its playfulness and its um uh I suppose they're examples of I like that in all actors I like I like a sense of playfulness and um uh sort of um spontaneity I suppose 
And then actually as a director or someone writing, I have found myself thinking of specific actors. Um, I'm writing something at the moment um, that the incredible, I've, I've been really thinking of amazing Catherine Hunter in a particular film. She's an incredible stage and film actor. She, people probably have seen her most recently in um, uh, Macbeth when she played all of the witches and also a little old man as well, I think. Um, and uh, anyway, I find myself thinking of particular actors because of a quality that I like in them and then them in my imagination sort of showing me where the story goes or thinking, oh, I'd love to, you know, I can really imagine Catherine doing this or um, <laughs> I shouldn't talk too much about it before I actually send it to Catherine herself. But it, in terms of, um, I do find, um, yeah, the actors in general, I find uh, are what interests me and they sort of come first. And I suppose as also as an actor, like if I know that a certain project means that I will have the opportunity to act with a certain actor, that also is a real like motivating factor. I suppose it's like uh, as from a writer's perspective, when you already have this admiration or this kind of respect for somebody who's already existing and you know their work and what they're capable of, I suppose the way to look at it is you're almost kind of pinning pinning your story on some preformed mannequins that you know will then show you back what, what the kind of assets of the story are. Yeah, yeah. I've seen um, I've seen Andrew Scott on stage a few times and like, I think what I find interesting is somebody who is very well revered for TV work or for film work, but seeing them a completely another dimension to them when they're acting live on stage, because there is that kind of, I mean, there's the rawness, there's the intimacy, there's that anything can go wrong because it's live and there's external factors and so on. But it's interesting because when I talk to people about Andrew Scott, they actually know him from Fleabag and from, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes. Whereas I'm like, oh, I've seen him deliver like a 45 minute monologue. Yeah. Did you see Seawall? Oh, yeah. 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 So beautiful. Yeah. Well, my my mentor was Simon Stevens. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So seeing that and then I think I saw him I can't this is terrible I can't remember Simon's play but he did it for the Royal Court and it was Andrew again yeah I saw it and he was like a rock star yeah yeah Yeah. um oh I can't remember what it's called yeah he wore that like sexy fur coat or something yeah yeah yeah. and the stage was filling up with water and like yeah oh I know what it was called um uh, no it's gone I we'll remember remember. All later. I can think of is punk rock, which is the other play, which I yeah, yeah, yeah. saw <laughs> in. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like seeing seeing um seeing actors like be complete chameleons is like such a kick, I think. Yeah, and to see them um sort of create in the moment as well, um, which Andrew is so brilliant at um and Juliet Stevenson as well, actually. I recently saw her in The Doctor, um, a play that Rob Ike wrote, wrote and directed, wrote it. Um, and uh, she's, she's so, she's got so much, she's so powerful and there's such powerful, you know, so, so much, um, so much experience behind what she's doing. It's such a brain on her, but also you can see that she's sort of, she's really just living moment to moment in the thing. And that's so amazing to, to get to watch. Yeah. What has someone done for you that made you feel wanted? Oh, that's such a lovely question. Um, my best friend, Jack, I sent him something I've been writing uh, and he, he, you know, he's, he was working. It was middle of his work day and I didn't expect him to read it straight away, but he did. And immediately sort of WhatsApp, WhatsApped me um his thoughts and I thought that was so lovely and since you know he doesn't work in film or telly or anything he just loves film has just been sending me ideas and um things that the script has made him think um I thought that was so cool that I've got a friend that um is excited about what I'm up to creatively um uh just out of curiosity I thought that was so so nice 
It's sweet. I always think as well when somebody t- takes the time and they they take the time sooner than you expected. Yeah, they do it immediately, and you're like, oh gosh, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> you can, you know, it's Easter weekend, like chill out. Um, but yeah, that is nice, isn't it? When was the last time you felt proud? Um, I d- did a screening of um, my short film for People in Trouble, starring Emma Darcy and Archie Medeque. Um and it was my first time doing that, watching of something I'd made with an audience. And what I've really liked about make, making stuff myself is that I can see where the problems lie and I can see things that I would do different if I was to do it over. But with this particular film, Archie and Emma are so beautiful together. And um, as an actor myself, I'm watching them in admiration of what they can what they're doing and I love was really proud of them and being able to share the film with people and people be moved by it or you know have, um, come away with feeling something and be able to say yeah aren't Emma and Archie wonderful um, that was quite a proud moment yeah. Do you like watching your own work? I don't like it as an actor at all because it's just so monstrous but to do it as a director, I guess, because I don't have to watch my face, I can listen to the score. I mean, I've only really done it once, so I'm just getting used to it. But um, I can imagine it's a much, it's a different experience. And you've been the one that's chosen how it's been edited. And you're making a collage rather than as an actor, the collage is being made out of you. <laughs> um, so I feel like it's a slightly different um, connection to the thing but easier yeah what is the people's biggest misconception about you I don't know I don't know what people think oh I, yeah I'm a, I was in New York last year doing a play and someone came up to me and said oh apparently you learned how to speak French in three weeks or something because I once I did a film in France and I once did an interview I don't know how, how it got mistranslated but basically it sounded like I'd said I just learned French like over the weekend or something. And no, it took me a, like a really, really long time. And obviously I learned my lines for the film during a short amount of time because they were written down. But I didn't become fluent in another language. It was this lovely old lady. She was just asking me, um, gosh, I, you must be really clever because you've learned a language in like three weeks. And I was like, that would be extraordinary, but it's not true. <laughs> you'll put duolingo out of yeah, the, exactly yeah wouldn't that be amazing? you could do that quickly <laughs> i need a brain scan or something sort of yeah. einstein what makes you want to see a film i suppose a, a, a trailer that like allows for mystery i was thinking about this other day um and also yeah like if, if a close friend has said oh it's really so, someone a sort of a close recommendation um, and then also, like, if it's a particular filmmaker that I really like, like Celine Siama, I will always go see her films. What did you want to be as a child growing up? I wanted to be like an English teacher, I think. I think I, want, I loved reading and I was like, what can you do with reading? Or oh, you can teach <laughs> other people to read. So I thought I'd do that. If you were stuck on a desert island, what one film would you take? Oh, um, that's a good question. I watched a few times for for people in trouble um, Les Amants du Pont Neuf, which is a film with Juliette Binoche and another French actor who's amazing, his name I forget. Uh, by <laughs> now I've forgotten the director's name. Les Amants du Pont Neuf, and it's a really beautiful um, piece of filmmaking, and I think I could watch that again and again. And you would learn French. Yeah, yeah. I, I can speak French now, but it's been years. <laughs> Do you collect anything? I collect books, <laughs> just because I've got shit down of books. Um, no, I don't, actually. But I do have lots of books that I, I should probably do something with because I'm probably not going to read them more than once. Are you an early worm or a night owl? I'm probably a night owl, but I'd like to be an early worm although there's a writer Edouard Louis who talks about how like the mornings were made by capitalism and actually we should all just stay out late and hang out with our friends <laughs> and get up in the afternoon the mornings is just sort of yeah an evil trick of 
capitalism. <laughs> I, I was saying this to someone else that if you stayed up late enough, you would end up tipping to the kind of early worm section anyway. <laughs> So I don't, I know there needs to be something in between, like early worm, night owl, and just something that's like... An afternoon person. I'm definitely not an afternoon person. That's right. What about you, Katie? Are you, have you got a... I, I think I'm kind of compelled by work and also how much I always have to do. So I generally get up early, but I will also work till late. Yeah, so, so you're I around have the clock. no routine whatsoever. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's the same, I mean, in terms of like, when you are making a film you're you're getting up at at least five o'clock in the morning in order to get to set on time and it turns out as a director you're getting up oh, even earlier than the actors actors love we love moaning about how early our starts are but there's so many people that are there before you which of the five senses so touch hearing sight smell and taste is your strongest yeah i read this question and i thought wow what a good question um and i don't think i can I know that like for all of us, like smell is so evocative. Touch, I find is so important. I'm thinking of someone asking me what my love language is um, <laughs> the other day. I didn't know what that meant. Um, uh, but I do love, I love all of them. Um, <laughs> and sight and here, here, I mean, God, isn't it amazing that we can do all of these things? Um, and sound because sorry these are meant to be quick fire i don't really have a quick fire answer i'm sorry i'm rubbish at this i got laughs i remember i've done so many interviews where they're like now just answer in one word and i end up just talking and on <laughs> well i think it's funny because um i did see the kind of similarity between love languages and this question because, uh, yeah and it's only in the last few times i've asked people that i've suddenly gone actually yeah because obviously touch um you know hearing like either you're a listener or you're a talker yeah anything else um but yeah I suppose I've never really seen the synergy until kind of you've just mentioned it there and I was what, like what about you do you have a favorite sense um I I'm really really like strong on smell like like when when my husband wears a, an aftershave or a perfume that I absolutely like it stops me dead in my tracks like I'll, I'll literally beat and I can't stop smelling him because and I don't know why like I kind of you know I, I like bold colors you know I love my music and I'm you know I also like silence as a as a sound as well yeah as yeah but like I think for me smell I I think it's like you mentioned earlier about kind of your grandmother's house that I'm I can smell a smell and it will just transport me and I'll be like oh I'm a kid again reading the babysitter's club because I've smelled something really random on the tube yeah you know Isn't and I can kind of like it kind of takes me places but I think I just love smell like I have a best I have a really good friend who used to wear Chloe that perfume I think like everybody every teenage girl wore at one point and uh, I always associate it so strongly with her. I smell it all the time on the tube. Like I, someone brushes past me and her name's Frankie. And she's like, Frankie's like, I don't, I haven't worn that perfume in like 10 years, Alex. And I text her being like, oh, I can smell you, which is quite weird, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's, again, it's going back to that time capsule. Because I, yeah, yeah. I think about all those memories, like, yeah. you know, people often, you know with with someone who you're very close to in your life whether that be a partner or a best friend and you'll always kind of have those moments like oh do you remember when we scaled that mountain or when we sat on that beach or when we sat and well we found that random restaurant and it's always yeah. it's always kicked off because somebody either says something or there's a smell or anything else and like I'm quite good with te I, I can also if I've eaten something, if I've gone on holiday, God, such a consumer. But if I've gone somewhere and I've had something really delicious, I can remember that for like a decade. Like I will always, I was like, yeah, that's that time when we had that amazing pasta and like, God, that sauce was so, and my friends are like, I have no idea what we ate. And I was like, yeah. And then in the evening, I could sort of have a, an amazing memory of, of food. So maybe that's taste as well. 
they're so evocative yeah. and, I could then, and then I can remember the whole day based on like what I had for breakfast <laughs> it's like memory me- memory recollection and you can hang it on something because like yes Ian's the same like if <laughs> we went to Paris um years ago and I found this very random small tiny restaurant that in typical kind of Parisian style you book but then you have to ring up on the day to kind of reconfirm your booking <laughs> So <laughs> I was kind of, you know, using my, my, my best French I could. And um, one of their starter dishes was egg mayonnaise. It's just literally a serving of egg mayonnaise. Ian still talks about that egg mayonnaise. It was like, so good. Best egg mayonnaise I've ever had. And we had that probably, what, nine years ago? I wonder what they put in it. That was so I delicious. Know. I don't know. Like, and, and we went back there um, again, like a few years later, and they still had it. And he was <gasps> Because he was like, yes, I remember. And it's just as good as I remember. <laughs> That's the best. That would be quite heartbreaking if no. Actually, it was kind of shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like he's gone downhill. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that restaurant still exists. I'll have to look it up. But, yeah, let uh, me know. If I'll try and find it. Yeah, yeah. It's called, I think it's called saint Um, yeah. And it was kind of, I, I remember we walked probably about 20, 25 minutes to the Eiffel Tower. So, but it was down like a residential street. Like we turned up once too early and all the chefs were sitting there having food together. Oh, they were so well, like they, because we turned up thinking, oh, it's going to be this big elaborate restaurant and everything else. And it wasn't. And they were like so welcoming. They were like, come in, like have, have some dinner. mayonnaise. <laughs> yeah, we're just, we're just having our dinner before we cook for you guys. <laughs> like, oh, that's cool. cool. I've always wondered which way. I always wondered if chefs ate before they start an evening or after but yeah it must be before because otherwise they would just be yeah otherwise it'd be like I mean depending on how many covers they do I mean this was a small restaurant this probably sat about I don't know if you did it by covers rather but by table so individual people it would probably be about 40 so it was was small oh yeah but um lovely yeah it was really it was really lovely like really cute restaurant one of my favorite photos I've taken of Ian is in that restaurant so yeah (laughs) that's super cute 